We're here today to talk about sacred succulents, those incredible plants that have been incorporated into religious worship and ceremony, in some instances for many thousands of years. Now, I find all plants remarkable, and I'm sure so too do you. But when we talk about the broader population, a lot of plants are easy to overlook. So it takes something absolutely amazing to elevate a plant to the point of religious devotion. What is that? Well, in some instances, it's to do with their life-giving fruit or their remarkable medicinal properties, or as in some, their chemical constituents. So today, we're gonna to go on a bit of a global tour and look at a few of these amazing succulent plants, why they're worshipped, and if we're interested, how we can grow them for ourselves in our own home. I'm Michael from Aridzine. This is Sacred Succulents. Generally speaking, I think I know a lot about plants, but I don't know nearly as much about religion. I've done a lot of research and a lot of reading for this today, but that doesn't mean I'm always going to get it right. So if I say something moronic or if I say something insensitive, first of all, that's not my intention. But I implore you, please call me out. Let me know where I've gone wrong in the comments and I'll do my best to make it right. Now, let's get into it. Start exploring some of these amazing plants. Our first stop is going to be Arizona in the United States of America. Let's see what we find. The first plant we're going to look at today is the incomparable saguaro, Carnegie gigantea. Those icons of the American Southwest that can grow to heights of up to 18 metres. A little bit more impressive than this seedling here. But it's not their size that makes these plants worthy of religious devotion. No. For the indigenous Thorna Ortham people of Arizona, these plants take on a cosmological significance. They believe that they were once humans, now transformed into plant form. And if you look at their iconic silhouette, with the arms, you can probably see why. Now, a lot of the significance of these plants comes from the consistency and timing, their flowering and fruiting. You see, every year when the saguaros flower, their fruit set and ripen in early June. And the people go out with poles made from ribs of dead saguaros to reach up to the very tops of the trees. They knock the fruits down, collect them, harvest them, they take the pulp, this thick, rich, red, sticky pulp. They ferment it and turn it into wine. And then when it's ready towards the end of the month, they use it as a part of a ritual with singing and drinking to bring upon the Arizona monsoon. Now, the Arizona monsoon, meteorologically, what happens is that the dry winds coming from the west throughout the year kind of ease back towards the end of June, early July, and the warmer, moister winds coming up from the south arrive, bringing with it rain, life-giving rain. And you can see how the timing of these events, they participate in their ceremony. And then very shortly thereafter, we have the rains come. You can see just why this is a plant that's worshiped so. You wanna grow saguaro from home? pretty straightforward plant. They're quite easily to come by from specialist growers and nurseries, whether you're in the United States or otherwise. And they're also quite easy to grow from seed. They do not, however, grow easily from cutting. So that's an avenue to avoid. What you will need, however, is patience. This is a seed grown plant. It's about three years old and it's barely the size of a golf ball. In all likelihood, you're never gonna live to see these plants reach their immaculate height. In fact, realistically, what's gonna happen is you'll pass it on to your grandkids and they'll pass it on to their grandkids. Maybe then they can enjoy this plant in all its glory. When it comes to soil, typical nice gritty soil mix, regular water when it's in active growth in the warmer months, a bit of fertilizer every now and then, and you'll have yourself a happy, but very slow growing sacred succulent. So that's Carnegie gigantia. We're gonna head elsewhere on the globe now to see our very next sacred succulents. We travel now to the Arabian Peninsula and East Africa, where we learn a very important lesson. Plants don't have to look remarkable to be objects of religious devotion. Allow me to introduce you 
to these two fairly ugly plants. This dormant stick in the ground is Boswellia sacra. And this slightly more attractive leafy specimen is Comophora myrrha. They're both succulent shrubs from the family Bursaraceae. And they are also two of the most divine plants in all of Christendom. You might have heard the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, how on that night he was visited by three kings bearing gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. If you're like me, you always wondered, what on earth is frankincense? What on earth is myrrh? Well, wonder no longer, because frankincense is the dried resinous sap of the Boswellia sacra, and myrrh, unsurprisingly, is the dried resinous sap of the Comophora myrrha. Sap? is a gift to the baby Jesus? What? Why? Well, these plants are incredible in terms of their chemical composition. They are loaded with a chemical called terpenes. And terpenes are the chemicals that give plants their smell. If you've ever taken a walk through a pine forest and gotten a whiff of that heady pine smell, or you're grating a lemon and you get a big dose of that lemon smell, they come from terpenes, pinene and limonene respectively. And both of these plants are packed to the gills with terpenes, including both pinene and limonene. The end result are smells that are just utterly divine. Nick one of these open and let the sap exude. Oh, you'll have to take my word for it. I wish I could share it with you through smell of vision or something, but alas, it's not going to happen. But the end result is you've got these two plants that smell like something worthy of religious devotion. Boswellia sacra, the frankincense plant, typically the sap dried as resin is used in the creation of incense, which is burned in ritual in the church. Comophora myrrha, on the other hand, more closely associated with healing and death. The story goes that upon his death, Jesus was anointed with oils made from the Comophora myrrha. But they're not just remarkable for their smells. These are something of wonder plants. The chemicals in these plants are also associated with all forms of healing, antibiotic effects, it goes on and on. And recent scientific studies have also shown, at the very least, that the smoke produced from burning frankincense, a bit of a mood altering effect. Not strong enough to really impact anyone but the priest burning the plant itself, but interesting nonetheless. And so that is why these two fairly ugly plants are certainly worthy of religious devotion. If you do want to grow these plants, I've got some bad news for you. They're incredibly difficult to get your hands on, and if you do find them, they are not cheap. There is a reason for that, because they are the most stubborn plants to reproduce that you can imagine. Boswellia sacra, this is a plant typically grown from seed, and germination rates usually sit in a span of about 5 to 8%, which isn't ideal in cultivation. But in natural habitat, it's an absolute disaster. Climate change is putting pressure on the populations of these plants and such a low germination rate is making the populations of these plants in the wild not sustain themselves. As a result, they're growing more and more endangered. Not great. As for Comophora myrrha, even more impossible to get your hands on. Seeds are very stubborn to germinate. I sowed 50 of them and got two plants out of them. But getting your hands on the seeds is an absolute nightmare. I kid you not, I had to pay a man in Yemen with Bitcoin to get 50 seeds. So, a bit of an adventure in itself. You do get your hands on a plant. After that, they're easy to grow. Gritty soil, as always. Plenty of moisture over the summer months. Bit of moisture in the cooler months just to keep their roots from desiccating. Their leaves will come up in spring and they'll have these beautiful and wonderfully smelling plants. And to add to that, they also have these beautiful little flowers as well. So 
if you can get your hands on them, well worth growing, but getting one, a bit of a tricky act. So good luck. Anyway, now we're heading back to the USA to look at another plant, which you may well be familiar with. The next plant we're going to look at is a cactus, regarded as divine for a very different aspect of its chemical composition. This seedling is Lophophora williamsii, commonly known as peyote, and famously containing a psychoactive alkaloid, mescaline. Mescaline, and therefore the peyote, is a controlled substance in the United States, and indeed much of the world, largely because of its psychoactive, mind-altering capabilities. But it's also a native plant to the United States, which, if I digress, brings us into this ridiculous and quite insane situation where it's illegal to grow a native plant in cultivation in its home country. Now what you find is that this is a plant that has got a long association with traditional use with Native American people. And in response to the fairly puritanical banning of this plant, we saw the rise of the Native American church, the church that kind of blends aspects of Christianity with the ethnobotanical use of peyote and ritual. When ingested, this plant brings about psychoactive visions, changes in mood, affects our understanding of time, and in many instances begins with kind of a ritual purging, intense nausea and vomiting. All of this sits at the centre of the ritual of the church. And understandable why such a plant, so small, having such an impact on us, would be regarded as such worthy divine worship. Typically what happens is that the mescaline is contained in a button that sits above the surface. And so you'll find these plants have very thick fleshy tap roots that extend deep underground. When harvesting the plants, traditionally, the button is removed and it allows those roots to regenerate and grow new buttons over time. However, these are also plants which, I suppose, because of their association with mind-altering substances, have been heavily poached in their native habitat and uh, therefore are under a bit of pressure environmentally. Now, if you want to grow peyote for yourself, there's a few things to be mindful of. First of all, if you're in the United States, be mindful of the fact that it's illegal to grow these plants and you do run the risk of running afoul of the law. However, if you're somewhere where it is legal to grow these plants, like Australia, then they're relatively straightforward. They like a real inorganic, gritty soil. I use a mix that's about 80% inorganic. They like a lot of sun, but be mindful, of course, to introducing them to sun if you don't want to scorch them. Relatively regular water in the warmer months. You don't want to overwater, you don't want to give them too much because what will happen is they can actually take in too much water and split. It creates a bit of an unsightly scar. And then when the temperatures start to cool, you want to ease right back. I don't give them any water when they're dormant over the winter time. And in fact, they have a tendency to do something quite off-putting when they're dormant. They go a bit squishy. And for many first-time growers of peyote, they'll think, oh no, my plant's rotting. Well, that's not the case. They just have this chemical component in them, kind of mimics antifreeze, which creates this kind of squishy effect when they're, uh, when they're not growing and enables them to withstand some of the most intense cold temperatures. They are plants that require patience. They do not grow quickly. And so, you know, it may take five years in cultivation for them to reach a decent and flowering size, which of course, calls into question if you're thinking about using this plant for any other purpose other than as an ornamental plant, is it really worth chopping it up when it's taken so long to grow? They're quite readily available these days, as you can imagine, fairly desirable plants, and seed is prolific. When they flower, they're actually self-fertile, so they'll create heaps of seed. So if you want to grow them from seed, you can get seed very, very easily from any of the sort of typical marketplaces. Well worth growing, beautiful plant, interesting kind of history, 
And I suppose a bit of a story to tell too. So that's the peyote plant. We're going to look at one last plant, also quite similar to peyote, but with a very different form. The last stop on our global adventure exploring sacred succulents takes us high up into the Peruvian Andes, where we find these beautiful blue-green columnar cacti. This is Trichocereus pachinoi, commonly known as San Pedro, and just like peyote, it's full of mescaline, which means, of course, that it's got a long history of religious use. In fact, historical records show that Andean shamans have been incorporating San Pedro into their healing and divination rituals for over 2,500 years. However, if you know anything about the history of South America, you will know that when Western nations arrived, Christianity spread across the continent. And when Christian missionaries first encountered indigenous people using these plants for their hallucinogenic, mind-altering impact, you can imagine they weren't too thrilled. They tried to repress the use of San Pedro in any sort of religious ceremony. But in a wonderfully quirky irony, we ended up with the plant being named after St. Peter. St. Peter who holds the keys to heaven. Because it's said that the mescaline in this plant to its mind-altering properties enables the user to experience heaven on earth. What a delicious and wonderful irony that is. One of the joyful things about growing San Pedro is just how easy they are to cultivate. They don't originate in the desert, so unlike some of our more xerophytic species of cacti and succulents, they don't require a real close attention to detail to thrive. You can grow them in a relatively rich soil mix. I use a mix that's about half organic to inorganic, but you could probably go a bit more organic than that still. And with regular fertilizer and water in the growing season, they can undergo a bit of an explosion in growth. In fact, if you plant them in the ground, you can have quite a large landscape plant in a relatively short period of time. And the added bonus is they produce the most beautiful white flowers. If you're more of a seed grower, seeds are easy to come by and quite rapidly growing compared to something like your peyote. They're also very easy plants to source. Although they contain mescaline, they're available everywhere. You can find them at large nurseries, garden centres. In Australia, you can find San Pedro at Bunnings, for example. So, beautiful plant, well worth growing as long as you've got the space to accommodate it. And there's always the added bonus of the fact that you're growing something with a bit of a spiritual significance. So that's the San Pedro for you. And that is our global tour of sacred succulents. I hope, as usual, you've learned something. And if you've got any questions, please, don't hesitate to hit me up in the comments or you can find me on Instagram at bayou.brothers. That's it for today. Happy growing.